good to see everybody here today. And as always, uh, give honor to Pastor and Sister Blizzard for their leadership. We are blessed to have such amazing leadership. And uh, our worship team, I get, I, uh, get excited just coming in hearing the practices. You just feel the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. But we want to get into the Word of God today. Um, several years ago, I took a trip with my mom back to her hometown, and thank you for standing. I'm, it's going to be a few minutes before I read scripture, so you can be seated. I appreciate Could have kept you standing a long time there. But I uh, took a trip with my mom back to her hometown in Arkansas several, several years ago, and uh, we did what many older people like to do. We visited the cemetery. Seems kind of morbid to me, but we visited the graves, and just her and I were there, and she reminisced and shared stories about the different loved ones who had passed away, and, you know, we walked around uh, looking at different tombstones. She cried a little, laughed a little, just sharing memories, and uh, we were there visiting her hometown because they have a big harvest festival every year. And it's like a reunion for that thriving metropolis of less than 700 people known as Corning, Arkansas. And my mom, as the day went on, became more and more disappointed, realizing that she was not seeing anyone that she knew. And she finally was sad as we got in the car and she said, I guess everyone I care about that was down here are now in their graves. And it's almost fitting as if we were in a bad sitcom or something. She turned on the radio and a song came on that Elvis recorded, but it was written by Willie Nelson. And it simply says, ain't it funny how time slips away? You know, each of us has a birthday and most of us each year celebrate the day of our birth. But there's another day that we don't like to think about. The day when our life on earth will come to an end. We don't know when that day will be. And it's not really something that we like to think about. But it's coming for each and every one of us. We don't have any control over that first date, the day we're born. Nobody asked us when we wanted to be born or if we wanted to be born. Ready or not, here we come. We don't have much control over the last date either. I mean, in a sense, we can have some control. We make wise choices concerning our health. But in the end, that final day is appointed for each and every one of us. But what we do have control over is that time between the two dates. We get to decide what we're going to do with that time between the time we're born and the time we die. And I know I'm going to sound old. I try to act young, but I have to admit that my thinking is changing and stuff. But has anyone besides me noticed that as we get a little bit older, it seems that time goes by faster and faster? You know, my daughters like to remind me at various times that I'm old. Several years ago on a family trip, Janae and Gia were sitting in the back. Gia was still in her car seat. That's how long ago it was. And they were talking about all the things they were going to buy. And this discussion went on and on, and I thought, man, that's really cute, you know, just to hear my girls interacting with each other. And I finally said, now, when are you girls going to have enough money to buy all of that stuff? And without hesitating, they said, when you die and we take all your money. Y'all, I didn't sleep for weeks. I had two little terrorists living in the house with me. I was afraid. That was pretty harsh. Another time when Janae was around seven or eight, one of her friends was over and they were playing. And then I heard Janae saying some nice things about her dad and bragging on me. And I'm like, oh. And so I kind of listened in a little bit and was disappointed to hear her say 
but that was before my dad was old, had white hair, and was wrinkled. Ain't it funny how time slips away? In Psalm 90, Moses, in talking to God in this psalm, says, Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. He's saying, help us to use the time that we have in a way that really matters, in a way that counts. Help us, Lord, take advantage of the opportunities that are given to us with the days that we have on this earth. In one of the most amazing images in my mind in the Bible we find in the New Testament writings that Paul is in prison. And he's writing one of his final letters. And we find this in Colossians chapter 4. He says, pray for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. There's just something about that image that affects me. Paul is in prison. He's in chains. He's been sentenced to death. He knows he's going to die. And he says to this church that he's writing the letter to, pray for me. I would be writing, pray for me also, but I think our prayer requests would look a little different. He's saying, pray for me, not for my survival, not for my safety, not for my comfort, not that I'm released from prison, but he's saying, pray for me that I might find another open door to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone. God, just give me another opportunity. God, I just need an open door. Give me another opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone. Then he admonishes this church, walk in wisdom toward those who are without the church to redeem the time. Make the most of the time you have. Because it's funny how time slips away. You know, in the 90s, some of you will remember this. A Latin phrase became very popular. The phrase carpe diem, seize the day. I personally preferred the phrase carpe per diem, seize the money. You get that per diem. But we need to redeem the time we've been given. So how do we number our days properly? How can we be wise with the time that we have remaining? I believe that we do that by walking through doors that are open and by taking advantage of every opportunity that's presented to us. We should pray for open doors and we should pray for the wisdom to take advantage of the doors that are open. So many times we look for openings, we try to angle and maneuver and manipulate situations, but we need to just pray for God to open a door, for God to provide an opportunity. Have you ever considered what is the most dangerous object in your home? What is the most dangerous object in your home? A poll was done across the United States of emergency room doctors. I like polls. And on the list were stairs. That makes sense to me. I've been injured a few times falling downstairs. I never outgrew that awkward stage. The bathtub, that can be a dangerous place. Throw rugs, that makes sense to me. Just about a week ago, I tripped over a rug. But it's interesting that according to these ER doctors, around 460,000 people a year are injured by kitchen knives. Been there, done that. Get a little too aggressive slicing up vegetables and mistake my thumb for a vegetable. 100,000 people a year are injured by power saws or other power tools. Around 100,000 people a year 
are injured by other tools around the house. That's why I don't keep tools around the house and don't use them. I just don't want to take any chances. Then there's other items. Some surprise me. Draperies. Every year, around 20 people in America are strangled to death accidentally on drapery cords. That one surprised me. I wouldn't have guessed that. About 4,000 of us are seriously injured on pillows. That one doesn't make sense to me unless it's a great pillow fight. Otherwise, I can't understand how that would happen, but I guess pillows are dangerous. But according to ER doctors across the United States, the most dangerous item in our home is an easy chair. We don't buy these chairs for their beauty. We buy them for their comfort. Anybody know the name of the number one selling easy chair in America still? You're right, the lazy boy. Not risky boy, not worker boy, but lazy boy. And we're buying these chairs so we can be immersed in comfort. When we sit in those chairs, we tend to start trying to think of other items to increase our comfort. When you sit in a chair like this, many times you want a special pair of footwear called slippers. That just sounds dangerous in itself. They're not grippers, they're called slippers. Then there's special kinds of food called comfort food. More than likely, our comfort food is not something that's healthy. And when we sit in the chair, we are usually doing something besides eating comfort food, and that is watching something. But, you know, even then, in the good old days, if we didn't like what was on, we had to get up out of the chair and walk across the room and turn a knob. Most of you can't relate to that. We had to turn a knob on the TV and get the static each time. <sighs> But then they came up with remotes. God invented the remote control so we wouldn't have to get out of our lazy boy and get out of our slippers. And we could still keep our comfort food and have that remote resting on the side of the chair. Then we got dependent on those. And if you wanted to see an ugly scene around the house, misplace the remote control. Anybody seen the remote? You had it last. No, you had it last. Chairs are overturned. Cushions are thrown every which direction because we can't find the remote control and we have to get out of our lazy boy and actually do something. Now, they have invented remote controls where you just talk to it and you can change the channel. Of course, my dad always had that one. Jim, get up. Change the channel. And there I was. But what troubles me about this is that, well, a few things trouble me about this. One of those is that some of you are taking notes right now. I need to get one of those remotes that I can talk to. And that might be the only takeaway you get from this lesson. But when we are propped up in our lazy boys, do we look like a person who's ready to spring into action? Are we in the correct posture to be poised for a season of explosive spiritual growth and development? If this is all life is about, if it's getting free from stress and challenges and problems and trying to make ourselves as comfortable as possible, does that increase our heartbeat? Does that do anything for our health spiritually or physically? Does it make us just want to spring out of bed in the morning and get out in the world and do something? I don't think so. You see, what's dangerous about the easy chair, what's dangerous is not just the stuff we do while we're sitting in it reclined, but it's the things that we're not doing. It's the relationships that are not being deepened. It's the people that we never serve or never meet or never witness to. It's the people that need the church, that need God, that need us to speak into their life and lead them to church and to God. It's the prayers that are never prayed. 
The prayer is like, oh God, open a door. Oh God, be at work in my life. Give me an opportunity to reach another lost soul for you. It's those spiritual conversations, those bold conversations we have where our heart's just pumping because so much is on the line and we're saying, God, help me. God, give me the right words to say to this person. God, help me know what to say or what to do to lead them to you, Lord. It's the gifts that we never give. It's the spiritual gifts that are never exercised because we are reclined and we are taking it easy. It's the spiritual battles that are never fought. It's the victories that are never won. It's the tears that are never shed. It's the open doors we never walk through because we are simply trying to take it easy. The Bible says, woe to them who are at ease in Zion. Can I tell you, we were made for more than just that. We were made for something more, something bigger, something greater than life in an easy chair. We live in a society that says that chair is it, man. Yeah, you work hard for a while, but the goal is to reach that place in life when you can just take it easy and just coast the rest of the way. That's what you work for. That's what you live for. That's what you buy. But the reality is the easy chair is the most dangerous thing in our home, and it can be the most dangerous thing in our life. That attitude that I'm just going to kick back and take it easy. That comfortable spot in the pew, that spot that, while it doesn't actually have your name on it, everybody in the church knows that's his seat or that's her seat. That little comfortable place where when you come in a couple minutes late and somebody's in that spot, you're kind of irritated. Oh, I'm sure I'm the only one who ever feels that way. But we were made for something more. God has called us to do a work. God has spoken to some of us. And instead of walking through the open door, we have decided to sit back and say, I've worked hard my whole life. I've done this. I've done that. And now this is a season for me to just rest. But that is not God's plan for our life. Scientists at University of California, Berkeley, did a study several years ago. They took a, an amoeba, and they put that little amoeba in an ideal environment. It was a wonderful little life for that amoeba, like us in our recliner. It was the perfect temperature, the perfect humidity, the perfect amount of light, the perfect amount of water, the perfect food to meet all of its nutritional needs. That little amoeba had no stress, no problems, and no challenges. And guess what happened to that amoeba? It died. Too much comfort is lethal. It will destroy our body and it will destroy our souls. Oh, it might feel wonderful in a moment, but it will kill us. It will kill our souls. We all want to be immune from pain and suffering and heartache and loss and all the trials and troubles and tribulations that come with everyday living. But these things... Without these irritants in our life, we will never be able to grow spiritually. We will never be able to become the person God intended for us to be if we don't experience some of these things. Go ask some Biff, some big old muscle-bound lughead in an exercise room or in a gymnasium, some guy who's just ripped Ask him how he got so strong, and he'll tell you, you build muscle by adding resistance. We want life to be so easy. We want a life void of resistance. We just kind of want to walk down a golden brick line path to the wonderful place of Oz or heaven. We just want things to be easy, but we will never grow unless we face some resistance in life. 
We must pray, God, I want to grow stronger in you. Lord, I want to go where you want me to go. Lord, just open the door and I'll walk through it. Where you lead me, I will follow. We need to number our days, but we need to walk with wisdom. Otherwise, our life will have no meaning. It's time for some of us to leap up out of the easy chair and pray for an open door before it's too late. I don't know about you, but I might be old, but I can still run through a troop and leap over a wall. I don't think it's too late for me to do a work for God. I think God still has a lot of work left for me to do in my life. And some of us, some of you need to realize it's not time for you to retire, but it's time for you to refire. It's time for you to get fired up again and say, God, I still got a work to do for you in my life. My wife's grandfather was in a nursing home. He had lost his sight. He was near death and we were visiting him, Grandpa Chambers, and he called us over and said, I I want you to pray for me. Well, how do you pray for someone like him? Someone who had accomplished so much in life, so much in ministry. And my wife said, Grandpa, what do you want us to pray for? And he's like, pray that God will give me more opportunities. Pray that God will give me an open door. That shook me. How can I ever stop working for God when someone who had accomplished so much, who in that state was asking for another opportunity? My wife's grandmother was in her 90s, and she joined a gym. And she was attending my church, and we were having breakfast, and we were sitting around her breakfast table, and she said, This year, I'm just asking God to give me a new ministry. I want to find more people to minister to. She was in her 90s. And I wanted to say, Grandma, it's okay for you to take it easy. But she would have have rebuked me and I would have had to have accepted it. This was Sister Chambers. But she said, I want to find somebody else to witness to. I want God to give me a new ministry. It ain't over for those of us who are starting to feel a little bit older. God still has a plan and a purpose, and there are more doors that he wants to open for us. In Revelation chapter 3, John wrote a letter to several churches there. And he gives some fabulous pictures of an open door and he talks about doors that are being open but so often some of us want to disqualify ourselves from ever walking through doors that are being opened in fact we may acknowledge that the door is open but say well that's not really open for me God is going to send somebody to do that work New Year's Day, 1929, Georgia Tech was playing the University of California in a football game. Late in the second quarter, a football player named Roy Regals played for the University of California, made an incredible play. He recovered a fumble. He picked the ball up, and in in his excitement, he ran over 90 yards down the field in the wrong direction. Finally, one of his teammates tackled him at the two-yard line to keep him from scoring for the other team. A few plays later, his team tried to punt the ball from their own end zone. The punt was blocked, and... The other team scored. The teams went into the locker room. It was halftime. During halftime, Regal sat demoralized, his face in his hands, openly sobbing, 
he had ruined the game for his team. Finally, halftime ended. It was time to go back out on the field, and Regals just sat in his chair, and all the rest of his teammates went out, and the coach said, Regals, get back on that field. He said, Coach, I can't do it. I've ruined everything. The coach said, Regals, you get up and you get back in the game because this game ain't over yet and you belong in the field. So who am I talking to today? I'm here to declare to someone that it ain't over just yet. It's time for you to get back up. It doesn't matter what has happened up to this point in your life. It doesn't matter why you're sitting isolated, why you feel down and depressed, why you are trying to disqualify yourself. I believe the Lord is speaking to someone saying, you get back up. The game is not over yet, and you belong in the field. Your greatest days are ahead of you, not behind you. Your legacy is going to be written by the open doors that lie ahead of you, not by everything that has happened in your past. Who am I talking to? It is time for you to say, Lord, whatever door you open for me, whatever opportunity you provide for me, I'm going to take a step of faith and I'm going to walk through that door. So we read in Revelation chapter 3, when God opens a door, no one can shut it. Well, I tried to do this ministry, but people were all critical, so I just said, forget it. When God opens a door, no man can shut it. God had a purpose for your life before anyone had an opinion about your life. Only God can open a door, and the scripture says only God can shut the door. The Lord said to the churches there, I have placed before you an open door, and no man can shut it. The problem is, one of the churches mentioned in Revelation had a problem. It was the church of Laodicea. They were the most affluent the most gifted, the church with the most resources, the congregation that had the most wealth, and they were addressed in Revelation. We're told in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, you say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. See, they're a church that bought some really nice chairs, and they weren't going anywhere. So God spoke to this church, and God said, those whom I love, I rebuke, and I discipline. That's part of the love of God that many of us need to hear. He said, be earnest and repent. I stand at the door and knock. If any will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in with them and eat with them and they with me. He's standing at the door of the church filled with people who have closed the door. They refused to go through an open door. We use that sermon a lot or that scripture a lot as we conclude sermons and God is knocking at the door of the sinner's heart but in its proper context, God is knocking at the door of a church that is taking it easy. A church that has everything they need. We don't need anything, the church of Laodicea said. He's standing at the door of a church. And he's saying, I have a door that I'm opening for you. But somehow, they put God outside because they wanted to take it easy. God's not going to force a door open. So he stands at the door and knocks and says, if you open this door, I will provide more and more open doors for you. But I need you to open the door to me first. He's talking to a church full of people who have become comfortable. 
in their easy chairs. I stand at the door and I knock. His plan is for us to be so full of him and to be living so much in his vision that it just flows out of us. That the vision of God is just so much a part of us. But so often, if we're not careful, we can become like the church of Laodicea where the vision gets lost. And we're more concerned about life and the sufficiency that God offers. You see, somebody somewhere gets gripped by a vision. God wants to do a work here. But it's not a vision about what they're going to do. It's a vision about what God is going to do and a future that's going to be created. But somewhere along the way, the vision gets misconstrued a little bit and it becomes less about the work of God and more about human activity. It's a vision that includes the goodness of God and God's kingdom and all of that stuff. But it becomes about human activity and less about the work of God. I mean, we reference God, we lead people to repentance, and we have gratitude, and and we have the right desires to do things for God. And so often, extraordinary things happen because some people in the congregation are on fire for God. But the focus is about how good God is and about the blessings of God and not about personal responsibility and what God is calling us to do. He doesn't bless us just so we can say, look how blessed I am. But we are blessed so we can be a blessing to others. So lots of people will start joining a church and get excited because they see results. They see people are being blessed. But the focus has begun to shift away from God and his goodness. And the focus becomes about numbers and results. And people say, well, I want to hang out around that. And so the numbers grow. And we say, look what the Lord has done. But what are we doing based on what the Lord has done? And if we're not careful, we become preoccupied with all the wrong things. We start focusing on strategies and techniques and methodologies and programs and numbers and goals. And then it's pressure, pressure, and then more pressure. And the ministry starts feeling the pressure because, oh, Let's set a goal of 1,000 this year. Oh, no, we only had 898. We're in trouble. We failed. Instead of rejoicing that people are being saved and people are coming to God because it didn't meet our goals, because our methodologies aren't aligning with everything, and because our programs aren't going as well as we designed them to do, we lose sight of God's plan and purpose and the work he desires to do. And we lose sight of the doors that he has opened all around us because the open doors aren't matching our methodologies. I got disturbed several years ago. I was invited to be part of a ministers' meeting of ministers from all kinds of organizations and denominations. And I eventually got so upset, I got up and walked out because they replaced the term souls with potential giving units. I was furious. Potential giving units. There are churches that target certain zip codes. Well, we want people from that zip code. I've been in meetings, and I've walked out angry, and I've lost some friends over the years. You know what? I want to target some zip codes. Send me down to where the homeless people are. Send me down to where the need is the greatest and let me see and what God can do through me to reach those people. You see, if we're not careful, what once was 
freedom and joy and reckless abandon and risking it all for the work of God can become replaced by stress and fatigue and burnout. And then the easy chair starts looking really good. Tell you what, thousands of pastors every year are suffering from burnout. Thousands leave the ministry never to return every year in the United States because something somewhere along the way got out of whack. Something happened and they lost the true purpose and focus of ministry. Several years ago, my church that I was pastoring was going through a really difficult time. I met with one of my good friends uh, Brother Scott Graham, one of my really close friends, and we talked for a while, and at the end of the meeting, he said, wait, you're not resigning? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not resigning. I just wanted to share with one of my friends, you know, what was going on in my church. He's like, I would have resigned. <laughs> and I was like, no, I just wanted to share with you the pressures going on because, you know, I want you to pray with me, and then later on, you're going to celebrate with me when God shows up and does a miraculous work out of all of this mess that's going on in my church. You see, my wife and I reached a point where things were so bad that we reached a point where we broke. But that was a good thing. And we just said, you know what? Who cares? This is God's work. This isn't our work. This is God's church. This isn't our church. And we just started giving everything to God. Lord, this house you blessed us with. If we lose this house, it was never ours anyway. You blessed us with this house. This is your house. This isn't our house. And we just surrendered everything to God. And suddenly ministry for us became a stress-free endeavor. It's not that we were apathetic. It's just, this is God's work. This is God's church. This is God's. And we just gave everything back to God and surrendered everything to him. And what, me worry? Ministry became so stress-free. And we just said, God, if you open a door, we'll walk through it. God, we're going to do everything we know to do, but we recognize it's not about us, our genius, our brains, our ignorance, any programs we come up with. This is all about you and the work that you want to do. You just lead us where you want us to go and we will follow. It's amazing the transformation that took place in our church and the miracles that started taking place in our church when we just gave it all over to him. When we realized this is a load that I don't have to carry. We can cast this burden on him and just give everything to him. This is not about my ego. This is not about my pride. Lord, this is all about you. And that's what Jesus tells us. Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. You know, when you just surrender everything to him, you don't have a lot of concerns about life. Because we recognize there are times it's a good thing to abandon everything to him and don't worry about a thing because we know everything is going to work out. It's the love of God that secures the vision of God. And his love alone should be enough for us to want to leap out of our easy chairs and burst through every door that opens in our path. It should be his love alone and the work that he's done in our life that causes us to leap up out of our easy chair saying, Lord, I want to do a work for you. Lord, here am I. Send me. Lord, I'm ready to abandon the easy chair. Lord, I'm ready to race through the doors that you open for me. One of my favorite stories of God opening a door is one I read a while back. There was a new convert named Bob. Bob sold insurance in the Washington, D.C. area. He was not involved in politics in any way. It was just Bob, the insurance guy, who became a new convert. But one day in prayer, he began to pray, God, I want you to open a door. He had heard a sermon about open doors, and he prayed, God, I want you to open a door in my life. And for some odd reason, later that day, he felt led to pray for the continent of Africa. 
He'd never been there. This is Bob, the insurance guy, new convert. And as he was praying for Africa for several days, he had never even heard of this country, but he was reading about Africa, and he really felt led to pray about the nation of Uganda. And he began to pray every day faithfully for Uganda. Several weeks went by, and he's out at a dinner one night with a bunch of sales reps and insurance agents from around the world and uh, some of their friends. And so they decided to have an icebreaker to go around the table, this large group of people, and say where they're from and what they do. And one lady at the table said, well, I run what is considered the largest orphanage and medical clinic of its kind in a country called Uganda. And he started crying and created a scene right there at the table because God began dealing with him. And he said, I have to talk to you. And he began sharing his passion about the country of Uganda. And he began saying to her all of these things that God had been dealing with him with. And he said, I pray for Uganda all the time. And he was asking her questions. And she said, well, why don't you come to Uganda and see the work that we're doing over there? A door was open. So Bob, the insurance guy, the new convert, got on a plane and flew to Uganda to tour this orphanage and medical facility. And he was disturbed and upset about what he saw. Appalled by all the suffering and poverty that he experienced while there. And his heart was moved because, you see, Jesus had his heart now. And Bob the insurance guy, the new convert, hasn't been a Christian long enough to realize that when you get fired up about something, you don't really do anything about it. You just kind of pray about it until the fire kind of goes out, and then you move on. What did he know? He was new to church. So Bob flies back to the United States and he's fired up and he's upset about the conditions that he saw and he starts writing letters and sending emails to pharmaceutical companies to all these multinational corporations and he tells them what he saw, what he experienced and he said every year you throw away millions of dollars of unsold supplies send them here to these kids and these families who are dying, you should send them Uh, all the supplies that you can. You should send your medications to them. And he began reaching out to all these corporations because Bob, the new convert, the insurance guy, didn't know any better. He didn't know Christians weren't supposed to do things like that. So what happened? All of these companies agreed with him. And millions and millions of dollars of supply and aid was sent to the nation of Uganda. Finally, the head of the orphanage calls and says, Bob, we have so much stuff, we hardly know where to store it, but God is doing a work here, and we want you to fly back over, and we want to celebrate you and your work, and we want you to see the work that God has done. Would you come and be our guest of honor? And I've got one minute left. Let me hurry. So Bob, the insurance guy, got on a plane, flew back over there. And because he had done so much for the nation of Uganda, and because it wasn't a very large country, the president of Uganda attends this event, and he wants to meet Bob. So he meets Bob, and he says, let me take you of a tour of my nation. And he took him all around the country. And Bob is shown a prisoner. And Bob ask about this prisoner and about other groups of prisoners that he sees. And he's told by the president, well, these are political prisoners and they need to stay in prison. And Bob, not knowing any better, says, well, that's not very nice of you. You should just let them all go. And he finishes the tour and he goes back home. And then several days later, Bob gets a call from a representative from the U.S. State Department. And he says, is this Bob? Bob, have you been to Uganda lately? Do we have the right Bob? And he says, well, yes, sir. He said, now you met the president when you were there? Yeah. 
well, did you say something about political prisoners while you were over there? He's like, well, yeah, I said he ought to let them all go. It wasn't very nice. The man from the State Department says the U.S. government has been working for the release of these prisoners for the last several years and have been unable to secure their release, but we just received word that every single one of them were released and they were told it was because of a guy named Bob. (laughs) Several months later, Bob got a call from Uganda from the president's office. And the representative of the president of Uganda said, uh, we're in the process of selecting a new cabinet and the president wants to know if you would come over and spend each day praying for him that he chooses the right people to lead his nation going forward. So Bob, who knows nobody, has no connections, winds up doing such a work for the Lord because when God opened a door, he had enough courage to walk through it. What are the chances the first century church would ever be successful in reaching the world? Not highly likely. But they reached the entire world because people like the Apostle Paul while in prison, while in chains, while facing a death sentence, continued to pray for God to open doors. Just one prayer. God, open a door for me before my time on earth is done. So here's our challenge. We need to pray for open doors in our life every day. Lord, if there's somebody that you want me to reach, God, just open a door. Or we should pray, Lord, I've got these people in my life, my loved ones, who if you return today, they will not spend eternity with you. God, give me the right opportunity. Give me the right words to say, God, open a door in my life. We need to pray every day for God to open doors. We need to pray as individuals, and we need to pray as a church for open doors. And I believe that if we do that, opportunities will be presented that we cannot even imagine. Doors will be open that no man can close. But it's up to each of us to decide. Do we want open doors or the easy chair? Amen. Amen. It's 2.48. I apologize. I owe you three minutes next time. There's a lot of good stuff prepared. Go grab something to eat, something to drink, and let's come back here in a few minutes ready to worship the Lord.